morning. Welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad you have chosen to worship with us as we bring to a conclusion our sermon series, Courageous, a look at the life of Joshua. We're going to be in chapter 24, the last chapter of the book. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Ushers coming down the aisle, they'll be glad to give you one. Throughout this series, we've learned what a remarkable leader Joshua was how he led the children of Israel into the promised land. Under his leadership, they were able to conquer all of their enemies and ultimately settle the land, making a a, a permanent homeland for the Jewish people. But in this last chapter, uh, Joshua has reached the age of 110. His life is drawing to an end, and he knows it. And so he gathers the nation together one last time, to share some final thoughts with them. And the bulk of chapter 24 is devoted to those thoughts that he wants to share. We're going to look at just a portion of that, beginning in verse 14, Joshua 24, 14. Joshua said to the people, "'Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt.'" And serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege we have now to gather in your house to worship your Son, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray your Holy Spirit would come now to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. My wife Becky and I are in that uh, season of parenting where one by one our daughters are leaving the nest and going off to college. And it's, a, it's an exciting time. We're, we're happy for them. And, and what lies ahead, uh, we're happy for us. And what lies ahead. But in the midst of the happiness and excitement, I would be less than honest if I didn't tell you there are those occasional moments where we think to ourselves, oh my goodness, have we taught them everything that we were supposed to teach them? Have, have we adequately prepared them for life? Or, or are they going to do everything that we taught them to do? Are they going to make good choices, wise decisions? I'm sure every parent who has sent a child off into the wild blue yonder has had similar kinds of thoughts. And in a very real sense, uh, this is the situation that Joshua is in as he delivers this farewell address to the Israelites. For several decades now, he has led them through some of the most significant events of their lives. And he has great affection for them and has become a a father figure in many, many ways. But that's all coming to an end. His life is coming to an end. And I have to think his heart was filled with a little trepidation as to what might happen. He knew very well the, the tendency and the temptation that was ever present to turn away from the one true God and begin to worship the false gods, the false gods of their ancestors and the false gods that surrounded them in the new land that they had conquered. All of the other tribes were polytheistic. And so he desperately wants them to remain faithful to the one true God. And because he is somewhat anxious like a parent, he does what any good parent would do. He gathers them together and gives them a speech. And as I said, it's a rather lengthy speech, taking up nearly the whole chapter. But uh, we read just a small portion. And even out of that small portion, I I want us this morning just to look at one particular phrase. In verse 14, he says, Fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Serve him with all faithfulness. 
I, I want us to look at that phrase in particular because I believe if Joshua were able to stand before us today, I think that's what he would say to Faith Bridge. Many of you are aware that Faith Bridge uh, turned 20 years old this year. We are leaving our adolescence as a church and stepping into that next season of who knows what God has planned for us. And if Joshua could be here in our midst, I think he would say the same thing to us that he said to the Israelites, fear God and serve him with all faithfulness. Now, that's a very biblical sounding sort of phrase, isn't it? That sounds like the kind of thing that the Bible would tell us to do, but what does it mean? What does it mean to serve God with all faithfulness? And just as importantly, how do you do it? How do you implement that particular passage in your life as an individual? How do we implement it into our life as a church? Well, this morning, I'm going to get real practical, and I'm going to share with you three ways that you can begin to live this verse out even this week. We're going to go grassroots here and consider some things that you, you don't have to wait until someday, maybe when I get around to it. No, this is some you can begin to do right away, how you can begin to live out the admonition to serve God with all faithfulness. And the first way to do that is by serving God exclusively, serving God exclusively. Now, obviously, that's the general gist of everything that Joshua said in the speech, don't go running after those other gods. You will regret it. It will turn back on you. It will only be uh, to your uh, demise as a nation and as a people if you choose to run after other gods. Remain faithful to the one true God, Yahweh. And certainly, that is a huge part of serving God exclusively. You might consider it one side of the coin, but there's also a, a flip side to that coin. If, if, if the negative side of it, don't run after gods, other gods, the positive side of the coin is make sure that you are choosing to do the right things. Don't just avoid the wrong things, do the right things. And one of the ways in which we serve exclusively is by doing everything we can to learn everything we can about the one that we are serving. We are far better equipped to serve someone if we know who they are, what their likes and dislikes are, what their expectations are. In 2002, I joined the staff of Faithbridge Church. And Pastor Ken and I had been friends for over a decade by that point, but I had never worked for the man. He had never been my boss before. And so I had to go through a bit of a paradigm shift. I was no longer uh, his buddy. He was now my boss. And I was going to have to begin to learn what are his expectations. If, if I was going to serve him faithfully, and I wanted to do that, I still want to do that. You know, whatever makes my boss happy makes me happy, right? I knew that I was going to have to take time to learn and look at Ken in a whole different way than I had before. And so I've been through this process over the last 17 years of carefully observing what is important to Ken? What are his priorities? And how can I best reflect those in my service to him? I know, for example, that Pastor Ken detests surprises. <laughs> if you want to absolutely guarantee that he have a miserable day, and thereby you have a miserable day, spring something on him at the last minute. It will not go well. I know that uh, Pastor Ken does not care for long, windy speeches or explanations. When I walk into his office, he wants me to be brief, be bright, and be gone. <laughs> uh, 
I know that Pastor Ken expects when we are planning for an event, from the smallest to the largest, we do so in great detail. And that we anticipate all sorts of eventualities, possible difficulties and problems. He wants to see precision. He wants to see detailed planning. All of these things I've learned and observed and implemented so that I might serve him faithfully. Now, even more important than my relationship with Ken is my relationship with my real boss, my wife, Becky. <laughs> For nearly 24 years now, I have been listening and observing, not always successfully, but I've been listening and observing, paying attention to what's important to her, to how she needs and wants to be served by me. I have learned that my wife would much rather me clean the kitchen than bring home flowers any day, hands down. <laughs> Other wives out there feel the same way, I see. Uh, I, I know that my wife uh, prefers uh, antiques to something bought from the showroom floor. I know that Becky despises anything to do with automotive maintenance. And so I take care of all of that. And by taking the time and the effort and the energy to learn these things about both of my bosses, my life's been pretty good. I've been able to serve both of them faithfully not by simply avoiding the wrong things, but by consistently doing the right things. And it's the same in our relationship with God. If you are going to serve God faithfully, it's not simply a matter of avoiding the other gods, avoiding the distractions and the sins. It's finding out what's important to God. What does he want me to be doing? How should I be spending my time on his behalf? And in order to learn those things, you have to know God. You have to be cultivating that relationship. It has to be growing on a daily basis. We can't learn about God on the fly. We have to invest time and energy into it. Because if we don't, then we're going to develop incorrect ideas, faulty ideas about how to serve God faithfully. We're, we're going to do what culture says we should do. We're going to do what uh, seems best and wisest to us at the moment. Bottom line, we're going to reduce our faith to, to a, a do-gooder sort of religion, where we hope if we score enough points, we've pleased the man upstairs. It's not enough, friends, for us to be law-abiding, tax-paying, church-going citizens of the United States. No, if we're going to serve God faithfully, we have to know the living God. We have to be men and women of prayer who make time in our daily schedules to talk to him, to share with him out of our own lives and to receive back from him what he has to say to us. No substitute for that. We have to be men and women of the word, not simply to gain more information but to learn more about who he is so that we might learn more about how to serve and please and love him. If we're going to serve God faithfully, if we're going to serve God with all faithfulness, as Joshua would, would say, the prerequisite is to know God, to invest time in God, and to come to a firm understanding of this is what God wants from me. And this is how I need to be spending the days that he has given me on the planet. Another way to serve God with all faithfulness beyond exclusivity is to serve God proactively. Proactively, taking the initiative. Notice that Joshua said to the Israelites, choose this day whom you will serve. He didn't say, wait until you get yourselves in a mess. Wait until you have some big decision to make. Wait until tomorrow. No, 
Step up, take the initiative, decide today that you are going to choose to serve God. When I was a boy, I uh, helped my dad in his cabinet shop and of course in various projects around the house. And my father, uh, putting it mildly, has a, a terrifically strong work ethic. And he has some very definite ideas about how things ought to be done. There is his way and the wrong way. And you learn quickly what his way is. For example, I learned early on, you do not at any point that you are working together, put your hands in your pockets. Because if your hands are in your pockets, you can't do anything. It sends a message, I'm unavailable. Hands out of the pockets. I learned to anticipate what he was going to need me to do. He did not want to be working on something, need a half-inch wrench, and ask me for it. He wanted me to be standing there with the wrench at the ready because I had been paying attention and knew what he was going to need. And above all, the cardinal rule was find something to do. No excuse whatsoever to be standing around waiting for someone to tell you what to do. Open your eyes, look around, see what needs to be done, and get about doing it. If we're going to serve God with all faithfulness, we need to be a people who are looking around for things to do. And friends, there is no end to the number of things that God needs to have done. We all together could serve every day for the rest of our lives and we still wouldn't begin to scratch the surface of everything that God wants to accomplish. But he expects each one of us as individuals to step up and to be proactive in learning. How can I best serve you, Lord? That's why all throughout the gospels, Jesus is repeatedly telling us what's important to him, what matters to him like feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, visiting the sick and those who are in prison, taking care of widows. Jesus never minced words about what he expected from his followers, but his last words to us were something to do. Just before he ascended into heaven, he said, go into all the world and tell everyone about me and my kingdom. In spite of the fact that the scriptures make abundantly clear what it is we are to be doing, I'm afraid that most of us wait around until someone asks us to do it. We wait until the church calls for volunteers. We wait until someone brings to our attention, oh, there's this crying need over here that should be addressed. If we're going to serve God in all faithfulness, we need to get past being told what to do and start looking for things to do, looking for opportunities to serve. In about six weeks, we are going to have one of the most fantastic serve opportunities our church experiences every year, Christmas Eve. Hundreds and hundreds of people who never darken the door of a church will come on that evening and they will hear the gospel. But they will also need to be served. They need a warm welcome. They need someone to help them park. They need to be handed bulletins. They need to be shown where to sit. They need to be given an introduction to Faith Bridge that says, we're glad that you're here and we want you to be a part of this community. If you're not presently serving, this is a great opportunity for you to step up, take the initiative and begin to serve. And even beyond that, there is no excuse for not serving. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call Faith Bridge and ask for Peggy. Peggy is my right arm. She is the coordinator of our local mission efforts. And she will be glad to help you, your small group, your family, whatever you need, get involved in service. If we're going to serve God in all faithfulness, 
We need to serve him exclusively. We need to serve him proactively. And third, we need to serve him expectantly. Joshua believed with all of his heart that the best days were yet to come for Israel. He knew that great things lay ahead for his people. Even though he was leaving the scene, he knew that the children and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and on were going to experience marvelous works of God if they would remain faithful to him. He was so convinced of it that he publicly committed his entire family to being a part of it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No matter what the rest of you are planning to do, I trust God enough. I believe that great things are ahead. And so I am standing before all of you today, God and everyone else, and I'm declaring my family will serve the Lord. That was an incredibly bold thing to do. But the reason he could be so bold was because his expectations were so high. He genuinely believed that God had great things in store. I think many of us miss out on the opportunity to serve God in all faithfulness because we've never even considered what God might be up to, much less stood on tiptoe with expectation, excited about the possibilities and the opportunities. Most of us, I think, are far too preoccupied with our own agenda to be able to look up and consider what might God do with me? What might God do with Faith Bridge? And God can do amazing things with just the smallest of opportunities. They don't have to be big, overwhelming, life-changing projects. Even with the small things, God can show us He's capable of anything. This certainly came home to me Several years ago, uh, I w drove up here to the church one evening for a meeting, and there were already a good number of cars in the parking lot, so I had to park a fair distance away. And as I'm walking toward the doors, uh, I, I noticed out of my peripheral vision a, a little piece of trash blowing along the ground. Well, I was already a, a little late for the meeting, and so I thought, I'm not going to worry with that. It's not that big of a piece of trash. And was just going to walk on by when I had the clearest, most distinct impression from the Holy Spirit saying to me, pick up that trash. Well, I decided to explain the situation to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm late for this meeting. And surely in the balance, you understand that what we're talking about in this meeting is infinitely more important than this little piece of trash. Pick up that trash. Lord, we have a lawn team. Uh, we even have people we pay on the staff to do that. Can I, I've got to pick up the trash. By this point, it had blown clear out of the street. <laughs> if I had just picked it up the first time, it was right at my feet. <laughs> okay, fine, I'll pick up the trash. Ran out there to the lawn, picked it up, threw it in the can, went on to my meeting. About two weeks later, at the end of a worship service, I was standing out in the atrium, as I typically do, when an elderly gentleman approached me, a man I'd never met, never laid eyes on before, walked right up to me and he said, Preacher, I'm going to join this church and you're the reason why. I'm like, well, great, w wonderful. What, what, did I, what did I do? He said, I'll tell you. About two weeks ago, I was sitting in the parking lot waiting on my wife. She was volunteering. I was there to pick her up. And I saw you get out of your truck and start to walk toward the door. And I saw a piece of trash. Well, <laughs> and I just wondered to myself, yeah, is that preacher going to pick up that trash? <laughs> or is he just too high and mighty to do that kind of thing? And he said, doggone it, if you didn't bend over and pick it up. I decided right then and there, if that's the kind of preachers they have here, that's the kind of church I want to join. So I'm joining. Yeah. 
A little girl came up to me after the last service and said, did that really happen? <laughs> yes, it really, I don't, typically don't lie when I'm preaching. <laughs> but I tell you that story to illustrate God can use anything if we will just pay attention. If we will pay attention expectantly, there is no telling what God might do in and through each of our lives. I imagine opportunities are passing us by as individuals and as a church on a regular basis. And we're not taking advantage of them because we're not paying attention. We're preoccupied with other things. We haven't decided to worship and serve God in all faithfulness exclusively. We haven't made the effort to serve him proactively. And far too often, there's no sense of expectation. I am convinced that the reason God has chosen to use Faith Bridge these last 20 years in unbelievable ways, li literally hundreds and thousands of lives touched all over the globe because of the ministry of this church, I believe with all my heart that has happened because Faith Bridge has chosen to serve God with all faithfulness. Oh, we've just gotten started. And if Joshua were here, I think he would look out across the crowd and he would say, don't quit. This is not the time to turn back to the old ways. The best is yet to come. And if you will remain faithful, if you will serve God in all faithfulness, you're going to see amazing things done in the name of Jesus. You're going to see lives changed and turned around. You're going to see marriages healed. You're going to see people delivered from addiction. You're going to see lost people get saved. You're going to see missionaries sent out from this church. You're going to see preachers of the gospel raised up from this church. And on and on and on and on. But it'll only happen if we as a people commit to serve God with all faithfulness. And so today I challenge you, how are you serving? I challenge you this afternoon and throughout this week to do a careful inventory of your life and ask yourself, could those three words be applied to my service? Could the words exclusive, proactive, and expectant really describe my service to God? And if not, Step up and do something about it. In just a moment, we're going to close the service with prayer. And at the conclusion of the prayer, um, you can begin to serve God right, right here, right now. Three, three opportunities present here today. One is to sign up and help us with Christmas Eve. A great way to begin to step into service. Another opportunity is by participating in Legacy if you haven't done so yet. And of course, this is the time that we give back to God in our service, an opportunity for you to demonstrate to God uh, my resources are your resources. And I put them at your disposal. We're gonna pray and then you'll have that opportunity to do that and then I want us to join together to look ahead into the future and believe that the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your call upon our lives. We, we confess that too often we don't hear it because we're listening to other things. But Lord, be the lifter of our heads. Help us, Lord, to see with new eyes, to feel with a new heart, and to be called to even greater things than you've done thus far. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to serve you 
in all faithfulness. And we will give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.